Hello, dear listeners. You're listening to the Game Pitch Podcast, a weekly chat between two pals that is all about video games and the game industry. Every week, we'll bring you the latest gaming news, hand out industry red cards, and pitch an all new game idea. The Game Pitch Podcast drops Monday mornings on the Project Nerd Podcast Network. It's the perfect antidote to your end of the weekend blues. I'm JD. And I'm Eli. Let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Game Pitch Podcast. I am your host, JD, joined by my excellent co-host, Eli, as always. Eli, you want to say hi to everyone? Well, hello, listeners, and hello to you, J to the freaking D. I'm coming to you live from my my fallout shelter. Oh. I've got a, a dusty pit boy here. I've got our show notes on it. I'm looking at it. I'm ready to emerge from the vault. I am in my regular office, so I'm not sure what happened on your side of town, but uh, things are pretty normal over here. Everything okay over there? Uh, lockdown dude <laughs> the virus is real <laughs> taking it pretty serious yeah i've gotten into full vault hunter but actually just a side tangent on that i have a uh, three friends that recently told me they bought guns and these were like the, the people that, in my life that i was like oh that guy i'll never have like buy a gun that's the guy who's like drawing a portrait of like i don't know jesus in the park and then <laughs> they're just like oh yeah we bought guns and i'm like why and it's because we're in fallout times which yeah. is it's definitely impacting everyone a little different, right? Because you have those people who are like not doomsday people who are definitely a little more doomsday now. And then you have like me where I, you know, take it serious. Like I, if I go to a grocery store, I wear a mask. But then there's also me where it's like, hey, like I can get margaritas to go now. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, like, this isn't all so bad, right? And speaking of which, if you're listening to this today, when it comes out, it's 420. So, hey, hey place it, baby. <laughs> we're, we're homegrown in Colorado podcast. So yeah, you gotta, that's so funny. That's so uh, dumb that this comes out on 420. I didn't even think of that. I didn't think of it either, but when I was looking at the notes, I was like, oh man, like what a, you know, I would say this is good for your commute, uh, but no one's driving to work. So it's good to just put on while you're hanging out at home, kind of surviving. If you're Eli, you put it on your pit boy while you just literally try to survive. <laughs> I was going to tell you, we're not a guns podcast. We're not a ganja podcast. We are definitely a games podcast. It is about games, which we haven't talked about, but it is a pack show. So we do have a lot of game stuff to talk about. We're going to dive into the Final Fantasy VII remake that came out this last week. And there's a lot of hot takes we have on that. Sony has patented something extremely interesting that we are going to spend a lot of time talking about and I'll round the show out and pitch a game. Yeah, man, it's it's going to be a good times because there's there's like so much news this week. We had more news stories than I think we've ever had. There was like 22. There was a lot. And so as always, we're going to go through our fastballs here at the beginning. But there's so much that we couldn't fit through our draft. And if you haven't seen that, you should uh, check us out on YouTube at Game Pitch Podcast. Every week before we record, we draft the news. So some stories make it onto this pod, but some get left behind. But that doesn't mean we don't talk about them because then we go through and record little shorts about those stories and we put it up as a YouTube exclusive. So so definitely check us out on there. Well, I was gonna say, speaking of YouTube, we have to give a shout out to we do. our man. Uh, I'm gonna probably say this wrong. Zimmer tracks. Uh, we are friends. We are best friends, Zimmer. So apparently, thank you for listening. yes. And then also Tom, we got to give a shout out to him. <laughs> we will keep the content good, my guy. We love you, Tom. We love you, Zimmer tracks. Tom Zimmer tracks. Thank you for telling us that our content is good and that we should be friends. We agree, our content is good, and we would like to be friends. Yeah. So I, I don't know how, how do we do this? Do we give them our friend codes on Switch? Do we make friendship <laughs> bracelets? game pitch friendship bracelets look but here's the thing youtube add a best friends feature already obviously give us a cut because it's our idea all right mm. and uh mm. and then we can make this a reality I, I interrupted you my friend and i apologize for no, that. no 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 uh, you asked me you asked me what i was playing and i am playing final fantasy 7 i just beat it last night Good. at like 12 32 Perfect. and i want to save i'm going to save my my uh my information on it until we talk about final fantasy because there's a lot of final fantasy stories what are you playing, pal? I'm playing Animal Crossing, obscene amounts of Animal Crossing. So here's the thing. I am working from home right now. I have my Switch up in the background. So it's not like even active playing, but like I'm just balloon farming, basically. The time played on Animal Crossing has shot up where it, like, I think the game thinks I like played it for 40 hours this week and it wasn't really active playing and like terraforming and anything like that, but it was really just like, 
listening for the balloon whoosh noise and then just like scrambling, running around for like 30 seconds, finding the balloon, shooting it down and then going back to work. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if I'd consider that playing, but then like as soon as five o'clock hit and like I slammed my laptop shut, then it was like hardcore terraforming because I just unlocked that. So like mm. I have this island designer app I found on Reddit and I've like uploaded a screenshot of my island and I'm like, drawn this design and like down to the pixel where roads are gonna go and it's just been like insane dude (laughs) my if you could see me right now my eyes just widened like you are an insane person so one i'm all into it because i I figured you were playing animal crossing oh it seems like every other day on twitter or online i run across something new that someone has done in the game that is amazing and it's like every other day there's something so cool like you shared a a tweet that was uh, about like the the art uh, gallery that people yeah That's it. Like there's something amazing happening in Animal Crossing like every day it seems. Yeah, and that's the cool thing about it is it is a game that just lets you have that blank canvas, whether it is creating custom designs to hang on your wall or it's terraforming your island down to like, I saw one dude who terraformed his island to all water except for the blocks where his residents were standing on. And so then it's just the screenshot of him standing on water with all his people in the background, like screaming. And so, I mean, you could do a lot of stuff in this game. Well, that sounds like a nightmare. I'm going to quickly <laughs> run away from that and get into the fastball. <laughs> it's like, yeah, torture these animals. PETA, don't come after us, please. J to the D does not fully speak for not. I don't support it. I'm just telling you what I've seen. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's me where I'm like, gotta give custom flowers to each and every one of my residents so they all have a nice, unique home. Like, that's me. Not like, time to build a trench where they're going to fall into and die. Like, I'm not doing that. Okay. I, I, okay. Well, then I, I rescind. I rescind my almost red card. I give you the pass there, but still, <laughs> Peter, don't come after us. Please, PETA. Not us. We're, we're you know, friend, friends of the pod here. Let's move right into our fastballs. And the first one is something I think we could all kind of see coming. And it's, you know, it's sad, but it's, it's ultimately for the best. So Gamescom 2020 takes place in Germany every year. It was canceled earlier this week and not postponed you know they didn't do the dance around they just straight up canceled it it's kind of you know bittersweet right because it's it's a big gaming event it's huge i mean arguably it's, it's bigger than e3 in a lot of ways just because of the international draw and just what developers tend to bring but yeah it, it's it's been canceled and we probably won't see anything physically for you know, another year, but they are going to do a digital sort of Gamescom. So they're going to still try to get these developers and get these publishers to come and and do a digital version. And I think that is really cool of them to just announce that straight up. No tiptoeing around. Will we, won't we, we're going to postpone it, but probably not like, Hey, it's canceled. Here's what we're doing. And I like that. And I respect that transparency, which is really good. It is. That's not what we had really seen from E3. I think they were trying as long as they could to make the 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 conference still happen. And Gamescom, they they did the right thing. And it's we shouldn't applaud people for doing the right thing because this is just what we need to do to keep people safe. So even if they had it, who would have shown up? But yeah, I, 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 I do, I guess, uh, not applaud, full applaud. I'll give them a golf clap. I'll just give them a golf <laughs> clap. I think the golf clap's appropriate. I think it's good. And what is not good is the next story that you want to talk about. Uh, Selena Gomez is suing <laughs> a, a video game. It's a clothing game. It's one of those uh, games where you like have to get diamonds and think that you can only do so many actions in a day. And it's this, this fashion game, this fashion clothing game. And they basically just like copy pasted her likeness from a, uh, I think it was, a, was it a GQ magazine cover or maybe not GQ. I, I'll have to look at the, the get the cover again but basically it's just a copy paste and they just like mirrored the image and it's like the same shirt the same patches <laughs> and she's just suing them she's just like hey you use my likeness without my permission and i guess this company or this uh game developer is notorious for this because they've done it with taylor swift they've done it with kim kardashian and she is gonna sue them for 10 million dollars <laughs> It's a good chunk of change. And uh, yeah, I was looking at this story before we recorded. And I think the magazine is called Allure, if I remember correctly. The photo on the front and the photo in the game, it is literally like a copy paste job. And then they put like a cartoon filter that you can like download off the internet on top. And like, that's it. It is 
straight up the most blatant copy I've ever seen down to the clothing details. And here's the thing. If Selena is synonymous with anything, it is quality. Stunning <laughs> beauty and quality from Miss Gomez there. So look, this game just, it's not up to her level and they need to, they need to give not. her the 10 mil, cut the check. There's no way she gets 10 mil, but certainly she'll get something. And then they're just going to do this to another celebrity. So, I mean, good for her. She hopefully oh. gets a little payday, but... Yeah, they could give her infinite in-game diamonds so she can purchase all the things and become the fast fashionista of her dreams. Except also, there's a quote in the story where it's like, Selena would never give her likeness to this kind of a game that uses predatory tactics. and blah. Like, they just roast this developer in the suit. So <laughs> I don't know if those uh, in-game diamonds are going to do much for her. <laughs> mm, I see. Well, <laughs> moving on then. <laughs> we're going to leave that in the past and uh, we're going to find our way to a new story. But there's no waypoints to get there. JD, tell me about Ghost of Tsushima. Yeah, so they have said in the uh, official PlayStation Magazine preview that came out earlier this week that Ghost of Tsushima won't have waypoints that tell you where to go in the game, which I actually love. I think that's awesome because it's this sort of feudal setting it's it's really old school right and so i think it's kind of cool that you have to sort of just explore and figure it out and from a you know developer point of view i think that's amazing that people are going to have to go through every inch of your game so it's not like you're making these environments that people may never even go through right like this is a way to force people to explore and force people to come into situations that maybe they wouldn't have, right? Maybe they're going to go against like a group of enemies that are just out in the wilderness or something that maybe if they had just been checking boxes and following a path, they'd never see. But now it's mm -hmm. going to force them to learn maybe a new attack mechanic, right? Or maybe they're just going to go balls to the wall and just run in and, you know, maybe that'll force them to learn different combat styles. So I think it's super cool. No, yeah, I love it. When there's no waypoints, they, they talked about how landmarks are more important. So I think this takes us back to like a time where you were in the wilderness by yourself. You're like, oh yeah, this is the river or this is the peninsula or, oh, hey, there's that right. rock. Just like you said, man, it's truly cool. And I, I hope that it's not as modern and it is kind of what they've kind of painted it to be. Uh, the other thing that I saw with this is that there's like these fickle companions, like people that can join you, but then based off your actions, they'll just be like, ah, nah, I'm out on this guy. So, you know, it might be something where like, if you murder too many people, the person you're with is maybe more a holy type person or religious and they, they leave because of how much murdering you're doing. Or maybe the other person's not on the straight and narrow and they want to go to like bars and drink. And if you're not drinking sake with them, then maybe they're just out. So I don't know exactly how the, the fickle companion system is going to work, but I'm interested in that, like you having to like impress the person so like really this is just the the pressure of all these dating apps being like oh my god did i text back too quick oh do i double text like oh god i didn't wait three days oh no <laughs> it's gonna be cool i think it's gonna be really fun and i i am excited to see what kind of uh companions that you can get in game and like what they do and and how your actions influence them like and i'd love it too if like you could do something that was just so heinous that this companion you're with like tries to betray you and like kill you and then it like forces you really like maybe you've been with this dude for like most of the game and then you do something that rubs this guy the wrong way and then suddenly it's you know like you have to turn on this guy that's been your buddy for the last you know 15 20 hours of gameplay and then like oh and a lot of games where you get party members there's like usually story reasons why they leave there's not like there's never been like systems in games because you get someone in mass effect and they're just on your crew now you know, oh, you yeah. get someone in a Final Fantasy game or Chrono Cross or something like that. They're your buddy. The party. Yeah. Exactly. Like, like they they don't have their own agency to decide if they want to be with you. So this is, you know, a new feature in a game. I don't think I've seen a game do this yet, either or one that I've played or one that I'm familiar with. So I'm excited for this. And just, hey, hats off to you, Sucker Punch. Like, good job. You guys make good yeah. games. I'm excited. But what I'm really excited for, JD, is our next few stories here. Because we're going to enter a land of happiness and joy. And that's exactly what we need in these times. I agree. The next story, that, and this is one that I drafted, is a Sony Play at Home initiative. If you haven't heard about it, there's some games that Sony put up for you to go ahead and download for free. I did it. It's the Uncharted Collection and Journey. Games that I could not recommend more. Journey is one of my favorite games of all time. It's Great short, game. It's sweet. So good. And then, of course, all three Uncharted games, which is even crazier because the PlayStation Plus game this month is um, Uncharted 4. So you could get the entire Uncharted saga for free right now which is yeah. really cool yeah it's nuts those are incredibly high quality games uh, i agree with you on journey what a i mean this would be a tangent but yeah journey was beautiful 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 and to get it for free right now is just phenomenal and this is just such a cool move from sony here's some amazing games that certainly will suck up a good chunk of time if you're stuck at home and 
yeah, I mean, what a better way to sell your first party first party exclusives, right? They've already made the money on most of these Uncharted games. So for them, it's like, here you go. Like if you never got around to playing it, there could be someone who bought a PS4 recently because of this whole quarantine situation that's now playing Uncharted for the first time. And they're going to be like, wow, these games are amazing. And maybe that's going to trigger them to, you know, buy Spider-Man or buy, a, you know, a different Sony first party game, God of War. And it's smart. It's super smart, but it's also business aside. It's just a really nice move. Yeah. And the other part of this move is that they established a fund of $10 million for independent developers. And I think that's probably the coolest part about this. So like, you know, the whole world can get their games for free. And that's great. You said, you like, just like you said, first party games, um, they've already made the money, all that. But this $10 million they've set aside, like I've even seen, he was the former head or manager of uh, Double Fine. And he recently moved to Sony. He's like, hey, if you need a part of, portion of this $10 million fund, reach out to me in, like directly. And he was like, basically saying like the 10 million is for indie devs. And this is just, it's, it's a really cool move. I, I applaud Sony, this is incredible. Yeah, I agree. Speaking of incredible and keeping the good feelings rolling, the Coalition, they are one of Microsoft's first party studios. They mm -hmm. developed the Gears of War franchise. They recently donated 200 Xbox One X consoles to a, I guess, foundation, if you will, called Go Kart, made by Gamers Outreach, right? And so Gamers Outreach creates these Go Karts. And what it is is like a little movable cart with the console and a TV and controllers. And it lets them move them between hospitals hospital rooms so that people who are in the hospital and, and want to play some games, they can roll that card in, hook it up, and then they're ready to roll. They've got a console good to go. So they donated 200 of those to uh, different hospitals in and around the area. And in addition to that, then they created a skin in Gears of War called the Johnny Cog Gear, which then a portion of that, I believe, or it, it might be all of it, I'm not sure, whatever, when you buy that skin, part of it goes straight to gamers outreach to continue funding this project which is just it's so cool it's so awesome thank you xbox i love you for this and thank yeah. you coalition like just awesome the, yeah so good yay it's it's so good like it's so cool i love that it was more too than just like here's some consoles like go for it but then like there's a there's a support stream of revenue now for them because as people buy this skin it's going to continue funding this project so it wasn't just like a one and done deal but it's like hey Here's an initial surge of hardware, right? Here you go, like go and run with it. And also like, we're going to make sure that we keep funding, you know, as, as people buy this skin. So it wasn't just a one-time deal. And that I think is is super cool. Again, like, the, the, and so I'm, I'm moving away from my golf claps and I'm fully applauding Sony and Xbox here. Same. Uh, we, we've talked about, you know, two of the, two of the big three. The last company we haven't mentioned yet is Nintendo. So Nintendo, they haven't really done anything for the relief just yet, but there are some rumors about, the Switch Pro. And this this is um, something that came out recently in an update where basically there was a system update and then buried in the code, there was a like an AX dash something, but it's essentially a, a, a new code for a new Switch model. And there's some behind the scenes stuff where people are saying that there is essentially a Switch Pro model. So this, there, there've been lots of rumors about Switch Pro where it'd have longer right, battery right. life, bigger screens, bigger system, like, you know, maybe Joy-Cons that are made for adults to hold in your hands and not little baby joysticks. Who knows? <laughs> that would be great. But uh, the best, the like the biggest, boldest part of this rumor is that there would be two screens. Right. What could that mean, JD? Ugh, I mean, so what? You think it's like a Nintendo DS style switch con i don't know man like i love the switch as it is and if there was a pro version i would just want it to have a better battery and have a beefier processor and like i think that's good personally like what would they do with two screens i don't know i think about the ds and like was there ever super compelling usage of the two screens like that you could think of off the top of your head that wasn't just like oh this is a neat like gimmicky feature but like it doesn't actually enhance the gameplay right i have a lot of thoughts um, okay my first one is that i really do believe this because this is a way for them to zig when sony and xbox are zagging so let's say let's say that they're making this switch pro model to be released in the next fiscal quarter after whenever ps5 and xbox um series x drop like that so that's early 2021 yeah so that'd be the that'd be the move and the way that I see the screen, I wouldn't see it as a, a clam flip over um, style DS. I would see it as the screen is behind the screen and like pulls up and pops out. Sure. So let's say the, the, the touch screen gets upgraded a bit on the original Switch. And then there's a screen that's behind it that slides up. And then that gives you access to every DS game and every 3DS game. And then the way okay. that the Switch is set up and maybe the Switch Pro might improve some of the gyro stuff. And then that can give you every Wii game that exists. 
So mm. what if this is a move to get every Nintendo game that has ever existed onto one platform? That would be awesome. I definitely think they have a massive library of games that they haven't put onto virtual console yet, and we haven't seen them. And I think there's also a lot of people who want them, <laughs> like a considerable amount of people who are looking to get these games. I just, I'm not sold. I don't know, man. I don't know how I feel. Like, again, if you can tell me off the top of your head, like a compelling use of those two screens that you used on your Nintendo DS, like, there wasn't. I yeah. mean, but it was all kind of gimmicky, right? Like, it yeah. was cool, but it was. It never enhanced the gameplay. And I think that's the one thing like it's very thoughtfully done with the switch is like what enhances the gameplay. And I think the whole console is, is built very smartly already. So minus, well, okay. you know, your complaint about small joy cons, but <laughs> you, you actually made me realize one thing just real quick. What yeah. if, okay, I, this is, this is not the Nintendo move. They would never do this, but what <laughs> if it was so that they, uh, they upgrade the processing power and all that, just so that you can run two apps at once and you can run Netflix on the top screen and then play your switch game on the bottom screen and have all of your, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. or YouTube on the top screen or Hulu or Disney plus, and you can have all your, your two and one stuff right in your face. Yeah, that you're right. It would never happen. Cause it's not the Nintendo move at all. Right. It's a neat idea. Uh, and it would be pretty awesome. That would just destroy your battery though. Don't you think? Like, can you yeah. imagine yeah, like yeah. <laughs> streaming on Netflix on the top and then like trying to play animal crossing or like something even more processor intensive like the witcher remakes you're playing that on the bottom <laughs> and then like you get like half an hour like it'd be terrible <laughs> <laughs> well something that's uh might be terrible if you don't know uh bobby kodak did i say his name right bobby i think so maybe yeah bobby kodak yeah yeah so if you don't know bobby kodak he is in charge of activision blizzard and uh recently they, they did some really cool moves they they basically let their employees work from home so um a lot of people are right. doing that they've offered them programs where they'll upgrade their in-home wi-fi they will our broadband connections they will uh, let them take equipment home from work so this is a, a really cool move and the craziest part about it and this is the reason why i wanted to add it to the show is that he gave 10,000 employees his personal phone number which uh i think is pretty crazy to do so that could like turn out bad for him or if you're posting the wrong dm or sending the wrong <laughs> gift you could get fired like i think that that's a uh, that's a little risky so this is um Activision coming out and trying to have some public optics, you know, some good stuff, uh, you know, kind of like what Sony's doing, what I, what the coalition's doing. Um, but I, I don't want it to be uh, ever forgot that um, this is some Kotaku reporting that uh, Kodak makes about 306 times the median Activision Blizzard employee salary. <laughs> I also want to let you know, in the year 2019, when they declared a record year for Activision and Blizzard, they laid off more than 800 workers and employees. So uh, let that never be forgot. I just want to let people know, if you saw the headline, uh, you know, Activision Blizzard CEO gives out his number to 10,000 employees for personal, help, like, call me if you need me. Yes, sure. Good. Yeah. Also... Remember that these guys, I'm not going to say they're evil, but like they're for in it for the bottom line, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. How many group chats do you think he is in with his employees? <laughs> like just adding him to stupid meme group chats now that now that they've passed out this phone number. Like it'd be the first thing I did, I think. Like he wouldn't have my number right away, right? So I might get away with it. Or like I'd make a like a Google phone number, like a burner phone number and just like oh, add yeah. him to group oh, chats. Oh my gosh, yeah. That'd be, oh, please. That's all. That's all I want. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah that's an interesting story i mean it, you're right it is very much a pr drum up some good good you know feel good stuff and then at the same time it is very much uh yeah it's kind of it's kind of crappy because then it it calls to light this good news but then at the same time it harkens back to all the really bad stuff that that Activision Blizzard has done recently. So yeah. Bobby might be a completely fine guy. He probably is, but he's the face sure. of all of this. He's the face of right. the company. And that's why he, you know, he's getting the, the, the positive and the negative, I guess. But giving your number to 10,000 employees, that's just uh, wild to me. I just want to bring it up. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, so I think we're almost halfway through the draft here. And the next story is one that you picked about XCOM that we talked a little bit about last week. But do you want to chime in tell us a little bit more about that yeah i just realized that you picked the bobby story and i like completely like hijacked it from you <laughs> <laughs> it's okay it you know you started talking and you just you felt really passionate about it and there's no way i could have could have derailed you i just wanted to hear what you had to say it was good it was great <laughs> then let's let's make a uh let's make a mid-pod trade and uh i am sending you cash considerations and uh, a compensatory pick in the future for uh your bobby story and you get the XCOM story 
you know, it only seems fair that, uh, you know, this happens and, uh, <laughs> I still, you know what, it's okay. You go ahead. Talk about XCOM. I want to hear it. Cause you were really excited when we were uh, recording the draft. So I, I want you to talk about it. Yeah. So there is a XCOM, um, basically an XCOM spinoff that's coming out. The best uh, thing about this is that it's soon it's coming out April 24th, which is uh, pretty awesome. And it's going to be $10 when it comes out, but then the price right. is going to go up to $20 on May 1st. The other thing that I really like about this specifically is that they talk about how when you get squad members or new people in the game, that it's usually a random role. And then now there's no random uh, randomized roles. Everyone's going to have unique abilities in the squads. This is kind of a departure yeah. for the XCOM series, which is really cool. Pretty excited about that. And it's probably a smaller game. It's like more like a, uh, a DLC download upgrade, essentially, but it's releasing as its own standalone game. But this could right. have been a full length expansion. It's not necessarily a sequel, but it does pick up five years after the events of XCOM 2. And uh, there's like it's like a joint task force of humans and aliens. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I love it. I think XCOM is fun. I love that turn based strategy. I love that this is coming out very soon. I think it'll be a fun break for you know, a lot of people, I think it'll be a fun break for me personally, like get out of Animal Crossing a little bit and, and spend some time on this game. And I love that it's coming out so cheap, like 10 bucks. That's yeah. so that's like so accessible and, and such an easy purchase for me. Um, Even if I don't sink a ton of time into it, um, I still think it would be well worth 10 just from what I've seen online so far. So yeah, I think this is going to be a blast. Are you going to pick it up? I, I think I will. And it sounds like you're going to be picking it up as well, right? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it comes out. So it comes out later this week. Well, I guess I should say if you're listening to this podcast today on Monday, it'll be up by Friday. So yeah, uh, awesome. yeah I think it'll be good. So um, <laughs> speaking <laughs> Yeah, JD. Uh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to jump in real quick. So the listeners don't know this, uh, or I guess if you listen to the draft, you would have seen it. But uh, I have a surprise for you this week. Okay. There, you know, in Jeopardy, when there's like the daily double, and you you stumble <laughs> on that, or like you're in a, you're in some kind of crazy British um, game show, and they're just like, oh no, whammy, you activated the number wang, like you know, like that. Kind <laughs> oh, of stuff. number wang. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. That's wanganum. So, <laughs> you've activated this week's uh wanganum i guess if we're gonna call it that or the whammy and uh you 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 drafted a story about a, a, a beloved video game franchise making a return i did what i would like you to do because you've stumbled onto this is uh tell us the story but as peter molyneux oh <laughs> uh i can do that i will happily do that so thank you sir <clears throat> no thank you fans are so excited for the Crisis franchise being reborn this week on Twitter for the first time in three years. And three years is roughly the time between Fable 1, which I had nothing to do with, and my beloved Fable 2, the best RPG of all time. But I digress. Crisis fans are rejoicing as the official Twitter tweeted out, receiving data, and now... The internet is a flurry with what could be perhaps the first signs of life for a franchise that has laid dormant for what feels like a hundred years. Speaking of, if you haven't played Fable in a long time, it is my pride and joy, but not Fable 2. I had nothing to do with that game. Fable 3 was the greatest RPG that I ever had my hands on. Thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank right, you. Gonna... <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to the pod. We're going to get JD back on the line. J... Rig, rig. JD, you there? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, what a, what a coup to get Peter Molyneux to come and speak on the pod. I mean, I know what a guy, <laughs> what a guy. Thank, thank you so much, Peter, for stopping by. Um, Thanks, Peter. So, he's already, gone. he's already gone. <laughs> yeah. He, he left it. Well, he's, he's, he's a busy man. He's, he's busy man. very, he's very busy. <laughs> Got to work on Fable 4, the best RPG of all time. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, he has publicly removed himself from every other Fable. So I guess so. <laughs> so, uh, you're right. Uh, or Peter was right. I guess that, um, Crisis franchise is making a comeback. They started tweeting out some things. People thought, oh man, what's going to happen? And there were rumors that it might be a revival of the series, a remake of the series, but it's been officially confirmed and it's coming to current generation consoles and also Switch. So, woo. It's kind of cool because Crisis was always the, uh, it's always been a meme game in some ways because it was always the benchmark, but can it run Crisis, right? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. to some, to some extent, like it's kind of cool, like that it is making this revival now. And I, genuinely hope it's just like beefed up beyond like any current hardware like we're on pc or just like yeah it can't run crisis anymore like we've gone full circle 
Well, the Switch is, you know, just a beefy system that can it is going to melt in Crisis. <laughs> it is going to melt in my hands. Oh, that makes me excited. So, so were you a fan of Crisis back in the day? You know, I played it on and off. I wouldn't say I'm like, oh, Crisis, yes, I can't believe it's making a comeback. Like, eh, not like that intense, but it is cool. Like, there's no okay. arguing that. It's it's really cool. Okay, cool. Well, then uh, I want to move on to our next story. Uh, I was wrong, JD. I was wrong. Okay. Um, I decided that uh, Valorant is cool. I, I did not realize that it was just basically the <laughs> frenetic, precise Counter-Strike control. Like, it just looks like Counter-Strike, but it then does. they just added in Overwatch bullshit. Like, right. I started watching some gameplay of it, and I'm just like, <laughs> okay, I get it. This is awesome. So I just want to let you know, one, I was wrong. I apologize to to Riot, and all. I apologize to them. I'm sorry, guys. Um, they do have uh, basically the new story that we actually want to talk about this week is they have this anti-cheat system that launches when the game boots. And some people were like, oh, worried that it's data mining or doing something out there. It's not. It's just checking for you know, cheaters. But this is uh, something new. I've never seen a video game have a cheat system that launches when you turn your computer on. That's something interesting. And then also that it's that they have that level of security. They care that much about people you know, cheating the system. Wait, so it launches at computer boot, not mm-hmm. at game boot correct oh that's interesting yeah because you've seen like games will launch and then simultaneously you'll see like battle eye will turn on like as soon as you launch the game and then it's like that's you know obviously the anti-cheat booting with the game that's crazy that it runs at like a hardware level as soon as the computer boots it's called vanguard Mm, that's a cool name i like that let's kind of move on from that so last week and and i think the week before we talked about obsidian's new game that's coming out called grounded it's more or less like honey i shrunk the kids when you're like running around mm-hmm. your backyard, right? Like you're coming up against like bugs and weird environmental things. <laughs> uh, and so one thing that they have talked about is they are going to add in an arachnophobia mode, which will remove spiders from the game is what people are, are theorizing, right? Like, cause it, it, it very much sounds like if you have arachnophobia, like you don't want to see spiders. And so obviously the mode would remove them. Right. Um, <laughs> it's like i don't know i, I kind of like the idea because it's 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 like an accessibility mode right it's like an accessibility feature and it's like a very common fear like lots of people are scared mm-hmm, of it right mm-hmm. so I, I don't know like i like this idea though it does seem weird because what we've seen so far in the trailers and the early gameplay is it seems like spiders are a pretty big like they are like the main quote-unquote enemy right and so it feels weird for there to be like oh by the way here's a mode that removes the biggest enemy like what are they going to develop a whole other mode that replaces some other bug in there like what do you think uh my hope is that it's just uh they cast ridiculous on all the spiders and they're just wearing roller (laughs) skates and they're like (laughs) slipping around all the levels so that you're not afraid of them (laughs) <laughs> i i don't know i i know that you're not too keen on this uh game i think it sounds fascinating i i am extremely curious to see what this mode actually does yeah yeah because their like, tweets were really vague like it was oh, just yeah. like hey we're working we've, we're working on a mode for you and then they're just like oh cool what's the mode and they're just like we'll get back to you or like shut up and you're like oh okay never mind like sorry <laughs> we'll make the spiders less scary yeah, yeah exactly like, like what know? is it gonna be yeah, exactly. yeah how like, how yeah we'll, we'll track this story i think this is something that's near and dear to both of us now because yeah <laughs> it's ridiculous we keep talking about grounded so much that i'm like yeah how can we ignore this as it develops so yeah keep listening if you have seen other stuff that we have not seen about this uh tweet at us and tell us because uh i'm extremely all curious in. all in all in on grounded so something that i guess that we're not going to be tracking or that people doesn't <laughs> people don't want to be made at all is a resident evil 4 remake there's like just a we've talked about this that there's a large like you know groundswell of people that are out on this right don't um, want it exactly but it, there are more rumors than ever that this is going to happen this is not a, a, a you know an inevitable this is an inevitability essentially apparently there's a team already working on it they are in a four-year dev cycle for this game to come out in 2022. It is a Damn. larger team than any of the other uh, Resident Evil remakes before. And this might be, what I'm thinking, another reinvention of the remake wheel too. There's even been people who have suggested that they might redo the story to integrate some of the past characters that weren't in, involved in this storyline. So kind of replace some people with some actually well-known RE characters. So what, what do you think about this, J.D.? Are you in or st- uh, still out? Oh, I mean, I won't play it because <laughs> it's, yeah, it's scary. So I'm already out <laughs> unless they make like, like uh, grounded as making an arachnophobia mode. Can they make a mode where like all the enemies are in rollerblades? 
but like I, you know, last time we talked about this, I said there's no way they don't make a remake because all the other ones have been so successful that they're just going to cash in on that that money train and just go for it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not shocking to hear like not only are they doing it, but like they are putting a ton of resources behind it. It's not shocking. Again, it's not something that I'll I'll ever pick up, but I'm I I have a feeling it will still sell very well despite this internet minority that happens to be very loud saying they don't want it. I think there's even more people out there who aren't on Twitter or Reddit, you know, complaining about this that will be like, "Oh cool, like I just bought the last Resident Evil remake and it was great, so I'm going to get this one too," right? Like mm-hmm. that's what's going to happen. It's certainly what they're banking on and I think it's it's what will happen. So I, man, I just, the internet's so loud about not it wanting is. this. It, it's it like just resounding, like, no, I haven't, I haven't seen anyone that's like, Hey, yeah, we should do this. So I guess everyone's gonna, you know, have to speak with their wallets and actually, you know, either put up or shut up. But it seems like Capcom's charging forward with this. I mean, it's not shocking. Yeah. Moving from one game about a plague to uh, some sort of other plague, JD, you got the next story. <laughs> I do. And I thought this was very intriguing. And so I wanted to round out my draft pick with it. So World of Warcraft, they have a server called Elysium. And that version of the server is dedicated basically to making the game as vanilla as possible. So it's the original uh, version, none of the expansion packs or anything like that, right? And so typically there's about 10 at its peak 15,000 ish people that will log into the server weekly. And so what they have done in this is they actually ran an experiment called pandemic in Azeroth, which Azeroth is the fictional world, right? And what they're trying to do is mimic the way that the current IRL coronavirus spreads and showing in the game how it will spread. It's almost like it's creating the simulation to show people how easy it is to spread it, but they're doing it in the video game world, right? And so over 24 hours, like they just saw this thing run rampant. There's a entire Twitter account called Elysium Project that is tracking the infection in game and like sharing these stats on it, right? And uh, it's fascinating. So like earlier or last week, they tweeted out a thing about how in 24 hours through using hand washing and sanitizing, they brought the infection percentage down from 88% to 42%. Uh, using social distancing in game, right? So it's just, it's absolutely nuts, right? Like it, it is, it's crazy. And the, the best part about it is they didn't tell people that used the server that they were doing this, right? So mm-hmm. they released it into the server, let it run for about like 16 hours, I think, and then announced it. And they, so they were like, hey, by the way, like there is a disease that we've implemented to this server that is spreading. <laughs> people are like, uh, what? <laughs> so it's just it's it's so funny to me i don't know what do you think about this have you read about this yeah yeah I, and I, that's why it was one of the things that i think we had to cover this week it's just very relevant to right now but gamers are infinitely creative man and i like, like everything you said I, I completely echo and agree it's just so creative and interesting and this might be a way to do things in the future i mean I, I don't know what the government has as far as their software but world of warcraft is available and ready for download if you need to <laughs> run some models yeah i think uh use part of your relief check that you got to buy a subscription and no problem you can start uh, simulating in game well ending on a sad note before we get into our uh scouting report here with our main stories for the week the voice actor his name is rick may he was the original voice actor for peppy the hare in Star Fox. he has passed yeah. away so very sad stuff here and uh, I just wanted to say um, that just one a resounding dual barrel roll for him. Uh, so, dual oh, barrel roll. Dual barrel you. roll. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love you, Rick. I love you, Rick. Thank you. Thank you for being a voice of my childhood. I agree. That's exactly what I was about to say is a voice of my childhood. A hundred percent. Yeah, it, it is a sad note to end on. And definitely, you know, our thoughts go out to the family and it, it's sad. There's not a lot to say about it. It's just it is definitely a voice silenced from when I was a kid. So rest in peace, uh, Rick. May. Rest in peace. So, yeah, rest in peace, Rick. Yeah. Moving into the scouting report, we're bringing you back to the number one Cooking Mama <laughs> info podcast where uh, we have more and more. This story won't die, JD. Around have you seen the clock, updates? Cooking yeah. Mama drama. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the updates? <laughs> uh, I have. I've seen. Yeah, it's. Uh, okay. Lead us in with some of the biggest things that happened this week. Uh, and I can't believe I'm saying this. How is this so crazy? Okay. <laughs> I, go ahead. 
Dude, it's just mudslinging now because the creators of uh, the, the the IP owners of Cooking Bob are just like, yo, this is unauthorized. We're taking legal action. You're not allowed to put this game out. We looked at the quality. It was trash. We said no. And then also, <laughs> apparently, there's a PS4 version of the game that was never discussed, <laughs> never approved. <laughs> and so <clears throat> it's so crazy because I want to get a copy of the game or if the PS, the PlayStation 4 disc comes out, like this is going to be one of those like, you know, that cartridge of eats like the, this is going to be oh, one of the yeah. rarest things in gaming. So I'm Absolutely. like feverishly going to try and get this game because it's horrible. It got, it's, it has like it's a terrible. three out of 10. Yeah. Apparently it's <laughs> real bad, but so, so one side of it, there's been some mud slung by the actual creators, the owners of the IP and saying right. this is unauthorized. And that's originally why it was removed. They went through some back channels with Nintendo and they're like, Hey guys, like, no. And then that's why Nintendo pulled it from the eShop. And then um, that company was still selling the physical copies through that third-party website we mentioned last week. And then now, JD, do you want to fill people in on what uh, the Cookstar publisher said? <laughs> like the guys who made the game? <laughs> yeah, I think Cookstar had, they cited it as being pulled because it has a ton of deficiencies. It's nowhere close to the overall feel, quality, and content of the game, right? Mm-hmm. So they are just wrecking this developer saying that it is terrible, right? Oh, and yeah. then- Planet Entertainment, who made Cookstar, is saying, we're well within our rights to publish this game. There's no active lawsuits that are stopping us from doing this, right? And so then Planet Entertainment was still selling copies on their official website. So, like, they're like, okay, if you want to shut us down from being, like, on the on the eShop or whatever, like, fine. But, like, you can't stop us from selling it on our own website. So they're just, like, selling these physical copies straight from their source. They might as well just have a trunk open somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're parked outside a GameStop, like, trench coat open. Like, hey, you want to buy a copy of Cookstar? <laughs> GameStop's closed, but I'm open for business. <laughs> No, they're just dressed up as the Resident Evil. What are you buying, guy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cooking mama. Kajit <laughs> <laughs> has Cookstar if you have coin. <laughs> I just want you to know that we are never going to stop covering this story. It is like I almost want to get it and then stream the whole game. Like I'm so invested <laughs> in Cookstar. It's 40 pounds on the European distributor website right now uh, for PS4, which again, if you can find a copy of that, incredible. And then I can't wait to see how your PS4 is mining cryptocurrency while you stream this. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's so many weird little facets of this. The game's terrible. We already said that, right? Three out of 10 from IGN. So it's obviously not good, which... Have you watched any videos or like seen screenshots? Like it also does not look good. <laughs> like, yeah, I've seen gameplay. It's it's the DS one looks better, right? Like it just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. okay, just just know that we are the number one source for cooking mama drama, and you can come back every week to find new <laughs> updates from us. Let's move on to the next story, JD. Real quick, before you do oh, that, too, okay. not, just to, just to talk a little bit more about the our around the clock coverage of this cooking mama drama. <laughs> It will be on the pod. It will be on the YouTube. We're going to post about it on our official Twitter at Game Pitch Pod. If there's any Instagrammable bites about it, get it, Cooking Mama. We're going to put that on the Instagram. Guys, we are the top news source for this, just around the clock. It's basically what we devote 80% of our energy to. Please. I'm sitting at the okay. news desk now looking and just refreshing <laughs> their website, waiting for updates. I have 800 different RSS feeds all about Cooking Mama that are just being fed to my phone every day. I've been eating food to get insight into their <laughs> development process. <laughs> oh, okay, nice. now I think we can move on from Cooking Mama. And I think you have a lot to say about our next story. Final Fantasy VII Remake. Lots of people have been playing it. Lots of people have been talking about it. Not shocking, right? It is this revival of a classic franchise from the original PlayStation. And yeah. Everyone's got their their takes on it. And so I love to hear your take because I know you just beat it. And mm-hmm. I want to hear what you have to say before we start talking about some of the other stuff that we've seen. So it's, it's a seminal game. It's a top 10 game of all time. It's a first round pick in the Hall of Fame of gaming. It's in the gaming Guggenheim. Like it just is. It is. Okay. It has to be. However, this remake of the game, because, and this is not necessarily spoilers, a lot of people know this, but 
this covers the Midgar section of the game, which is effectively the first disc of Final Fantasy VII. And there are multiple right. discs for Final Fantasy VII. Yep. And th- there was a lot of a hubbub out there that this would be multi-part and they would take it in chunks. And I'm sad to inform you that I think this was a move to move their bottom line to get more money. Agreed. Because a lot of this game feels like filler. There's so much filler. There's all these unnecessary mini games and just sections that I'm just like, oh, okay, like... Yes, these are side quests and I get games have side quests, but like I'm resoundingly disappointed in the game and I can't believe it's getting the reviews it's getting. I, I don't get it. Hey, look, maybe I'm I'm super wrong and people just have a nostalgia for this. It, it's that's gonna paint over a lot of the mistakes. But I just want to specifically dive into just the mini games. They are like really bad. Like they really, really <laughs> like all any of the like it's like, hey, you're on a motorcycle or you're like any of the stuff that's like a mini game that's not the game there's so many times where they're taking me away because the combat system is actually really, really good. It's like incredible. One of the best Final Fantasy combat systems ever. And they take okay. you away from the game so many times. It's just, let me play. It's like, there's not enough battles. There's not, like, let me grind. It's an RPG. Like, I want to grind. <laughs> Why aren't the enemies responding where I am? Like, I would like to fight more because the fighting is so much fun. And yeah. the mini games they really take you out of that. I think one thing I just want to highlight, because I'm going to do a full review and I have a lot of hot, fire to spit and i'm going to split it up into spoiler section and non-spoiler section because i don't want to spoil anything for people who haven't played but uh what i what i do want to say is there is a specific mini game and i don't know why square enix gets a pass on this but it and maybe i need to, to talk to some ladies in my life to maybe that it's not my perception of it but they make up all these bs reasons for the squad to get split up where it's like hey now you're playing as this person now you're playing as that person or like oh this person is in this room and they're going to watch this thing so they sure. go off as the other two people it's like all of the times that you get split up are just really stupid BS. And it's like, you can see the work, like you can see their, their like math work. They're like, Oh, we got to divide by this to get, like, you can see them like straining the game mm, to split okay. up the, the people, which really sucks. But this one specific mini game, there's no reason why cloud has to say, stay where he is. And Aerith and Tifa go off to this pump where they have to, as ladies in skimpy ish <laughs> outfits have to like pump a thing. And it's like, you know, tapping X repeatedly to make, Tifa pump and move up and, and like, I don't know, like for me, I don't know. And, and like I said, maybe I need to speak to some women in my life, but for me, I'm like, man, this is some like BS that a Hollywood studio wouldn't get away with. And like, you know, there's all this stuff in movies right. now where they get shit on for being overly sexualized <laughs> or like doing like the Charlie's angels too, like kind of right, bullshit. right, right. And Square Enix just resoundingly gets a pass on all this stuff. And maybe it's different. It's a culture thing. And maybe that's a part of like J- Japan and like the, the development there. But for me, man, I was just like, this is BS. Why do they get a pass on all of this like overly sure. like just creepy weird stuff? And that's that's just one small instance, but it's all over the game. There's all this weird crap that I'm just like, this is creepy. How is no one talking about this? Yeah, that's I mean, so I haven't played the remake yet. I probably will. Right. Like I love Final Fantasy seven growing up. Like I remember I didn't even have a PlayStation yet. And I would go across the street to one of my neighbors who did and like play on his. And it was just ugh, it was just so awesome. And it is like a cornerstone gaming memory for me. And so mm-hmm. it kind of saddens me. And it it kind like I'm afraid almost to, to dive into this remake because I really don't want to sour that childhood mm-hmm. memory of this game. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's true. Like I hear you you talk about it. And then I have other friends that are telling me it's incredible. And then I'm like, I'm reading stuff online. It's just about like how they've butchered some of the difficulty or the exploration. And I've seen so many people say the same thing that you have about these like little side quests and mini games just being so dumb, like, and just such a waste of time ultimately, but like things you almost have to do if you want to move in the story meaningfully. And then like, I think one of the other things is there's the whole fiasco about the difficulty. And I think it was Kutako who reported about this, right? About, Mm -hmm the game being way too easy and still like people are one of the quotes I think I've seen on Kutako was about how easy mode in final fantasy isn't even the easiest mode. Like there's a version called classic and in the classic mode, your character auto attacks and defends. So you don't have to do anything right. Like (laughs) (laughs) what in the world? How is that fun? Like, so you're just sort of moving the joysticks around and doing nothing else. And your, your characters are just, You know, like clouds just automatically slaying everyone for you. And you're just like, oh, cool. I get to watch. Like, how is that fun? (laughs) How is that cool? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I just, I I believe you just like are selecting commands, but it's, it's weird to me. Like I said, man, I, I I was just like, I feel like the review score got bumped up a few points just for the, the clout because Square Enix. Nostalgia. Yeah. Well, well that, and you can't like, I, I don't think that you can give that 
low of a score to square because they might cut you off. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I, I don't want to make that assumption and just like, just say it boldly like that. But it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, I feel like some of the renowned studios get like a point and a half bump on some of their games just because they are who they are. Yeah, I can see that. Like, and to your point about like, being cut off right like i think that's still very valid to say because i i do think there's that fear of oh man like your review copy might have gotten delayed like i don't know why it's taking so long right like oh oops like sorry we forgot to give you a review copy this go around like oh, yeah. and it's like it's kind of crappy but like also it it's not it's not that out of the question right like that absolutely probably still happens and if you're not this big review site or, or even if you are, right? Like you can't risk not getting those day one clicks if you're IGN mm -hmm. or if you're mm -hmm. Kotaku or Polygon or whatever, right? And and I think you're right. Like there's probably some of that. I think there's probably some nostalgia where people are remembering like, man, this game is amazing and it's still amazing. Like even despite this, this, and this, this game still is just as I remember, right? And yeah. so that just as I remember is like, like me where I'm like, holy, like this game is amazing. Like this is legitimately, there's, you know, like 12 year old me, like, oh, I love this game. And so then there's the fear of re forwarding now where I'm like, Ugh, like, I don't know, man, I don't want to so, step on that. Yeah. Well, if you'd like, I will drive my PlayStation over to your house in a plastic bag so you can play it. Cause it's on my system and you can just like, <laughs> we'll just do like a, a hobo handoff kind of thing. And I'll just like leave it on the porch and run away. And you could spray it down with my saw kind of thing. But uh, <laughs> there's, there's two like last things that I want to say, cause the parts of this game that are great, are really really great like there there are some things in here that you're just like yeah this is effing sick i'm so glad that this exists the, like okay. i said the gameplay the combat so freaking cool and i will have a few uh, a full review up on uh, project nerd when i do write that probably this weekend but um last two things i wanted to say is it definitely feels like 20 hours of gameplay that they needed to find a way to stretch into 40 so like that's mm -hmm. the first thing like that's the headline like that it's just a fact to me at least okay okay and then um the last thing i want to say is that it feels like this game has been unfortunately infected with the worst parts of Kingdom Hearts. It's like they took the worst <laughs> things, like the things that don't work in Kingdom Hearts, and they were just like, yeah, that's just what Square Enix games are now. So this might be partially because Tetsuo Nomura is the director of the game, but right. I, I will say that the things that irritate me in Kingdom Hearts didn't used to appear in Final Fantasy, and vice versa, the things in Final Fantasy that irritated me didn't used to appear in Kingdom Hearts, and now that just seems like what Square Enix games are, and that makes yeah. me sad. Yeah, that is sad. That's, I mean, again, I think about Kingdom Hearts and oh my gosh, like what a insane part of, you know, growing up those games were for me. And yeah, it's, I don't know. It's sad to see this mix of these franchises almost in, in the styles of gameplay and the, the design choices that are being made. Like there's definitely some bitterness to that. And it's, uh, it's sad to see. And again, I probably will play this remake. I, I, I can't imagine I get away without playing it just because I loved Final Fantasy VII so much. And mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine not playing it, but it is hard to imagine it skewing that memory for me too so yeah, and, I and i think i think you, you'll probably like it. i think a lot of people will really yeah. enjoy it uh last things i just want to say because there's a lot of other final fantasy stuff that's been happening <laughs> this week there was this uh fiasco that happened on kotaku where the headline of the article was essentially final fantasy uh 7 remakes easy mode is way too easy and right. there was a lot of backlash on twitter where people were saying uh like making jokes like goldilocks stuff like oh water is wet that those kind of things and then there was a um a large um like outcry from the uh, community that that might need um, accessibility reasons that that's why it's that easy. But yeah. I'm here to tell you, uh, if you play on easy mode, it is not more accessible. Like the mini games are still just as hard or stupid or tedious. So like I, I get what they're saying that maybe the easy mode needs to be there for accessibility reasons, but sure. that mode is not adapted to help people who cannot uh, use a regular game controller have to use the Xbox adaptive controller. It is not that. So th there have been a lot of people that just read the headline and then jumped on the anger train. And this is something I wanted to highlight Naturally. Real quick, is that the person who wrote the article, if you read the content of the article, they were actually trying to say there's too much of a difference between the normal mode and the easy mode, as far as the disparity of difficulty. Now, if you're in JD and I were both writers and we know this, but the person who writes the article does not always make the headline. There are right. people who are just in charge of making headlines. And so all these people are crapping on this person for something that I thought was actually pretty, pretty well written. Um, sure. Just because the headline was, you know, that, that gotcha media, like, oh, this is too easy. And then everyone's crapping on Kotaku. Everyone's crapping on the, the person, the article, and just like resoundingly people in games journalism were just like, brah. And I was like, guys, I get it. Bad headline. You're right. 
make yeah. fun of them, roast them. I get it. But also read the article. Like that's that's a portion of it. You got to read the article. And Kotaku I updated agree. the headline too. They they did. They admitted that they, they went down there. But just to keep in mind that not every time a person who writes something writes the headline. Uh-huh. No, I agree. Yeah. I mean, that's our experience, right? Where we'll put together a headline sometimes and submit it for review and then the headline gets changed or like, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we'll see little tweaks here and there. It it is just the way that publishing in this, this new world media goes. So um, one last thing I want you to tell me is on the notes, you put a little bullet on here that says Final Fantasy VII times Butterfinger. And I've, I've been dying this whole time we've been talking about Final Fantasy VII for you to bring this up. So please, what the hell are you talking about? So Butterfinger has a partnership with Final Fantasy VII, but <laughs> Final Fantasy, the name of the game, Cloud, is nowhere on the marketing. So like on their story, it was just like Cloud looking at a large Butterfinger on Butterfinger's story. <laughs> and then they sent all these like streamers and like influencer personalities, all this Butterfinger cross Final Fantasy VII gear that makes no sense to me. And I, like, like there's no cleverness to it. And it's like Butterfinger was like, hey guys, we would like to partner with you. And then Square was like, all right, but you can't use our name. You can't say cloud. You can't even have cloud looking at clouds, honestly. Uh, really just blue background behind him. Um, uh, you Use the papyrus font <laughs> and just say Butterfinger. Like, it's so bizarre. It's so bad. How desperate was I when, you, when I saw this for the... I wish there was some weird Photoshop where it was like the giant sword... <laughs> is a butterfinger yes, that's all that i wanted sense. just replace the buster sword on his back with a butterfinger it's that's that all easy. i wanted there all it i is. wanted it, it it's it's the worst like marketing campaign i've seen in a long time and i don't know who at butterfinger paid for this because like none of the marketing material even says final fantasy it's just cloud if you know cloud <laughs> staring at a butterfinger it what if it, you don't other know stuff. cloud too <laughs> exactly <laughs> like, it's just like who's this anime guy looking at this butterfinger like some grandma <laughs> who loves butterfingers following the butterfinger instagram account checking that that story that's a day. thing <laughs> <laughs> oh and if you got i didn't want to tell people if you didn't know um badger from breaking bad he's wedge in ff7 remake it's pretty great <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, he's the voice. It's pretty awesome. It is going to kind of ruin it for me, though, to like, I'm just going to hear him and just think, oh, Mr. White. Like The thing that I was hoping. He's like, oh, you're Heisenberg? Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's cool because they put uh, Biggs and Wedge in the Final Fantasy games, and that's a homage to Star Wars Biggs and Wedge. I love it. And I was really hoping that Biggs would be voiced by Skitty Pete. It didn't happen. Oh, my God. I want you to know in my headcanon, that is who Biggs is. He's Skitty Pete. That would be incredible. Oh, what a missed opportunity <laughs> to have so much crossover between all of these universes. Gosh, that would have been amazing. So, so JD, we called a lot of plays for me in that last one because I played Final Fantasy. I would like you to take the ball and just really, really take over of this next story about <laughs> a Sony patent that is mind boggling. Please, please. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure where to even start. <laughs> but, so Sony patent this week the u.s patent and trademark office website they have these images that are a player sitting on a couch and right next to them is some sort of a autonomous robot gaming companion right it looks like it it the the photo is like this weird little amorphous blob that has shoes on and two eyes but no mouth and it has like weird little nubs for arms okay And if you read the patent, it's the robot's autonomous and it will sit beside you and it will basically like play the game with you, right? So like the companion would control the, like if you're playing a game that's two player, the companion would play the opposite team for you, right? So you don't have to play the AI, but you kind of are playing AI still, but like you have this weird creature robot sitting next to you that you would like be able to... I don't know, punch if it beats you. I don't know, like, what do you do with this thing, right? And then, like, this weird robot will also, like, measure, like, feelings of the player. So it will be able to detect joy, anger, love, surprise, all these different, like, player states. Um, It will have a, we talked about before, a patent that Sony had for a biosensor that would detect sweat and heart rate. And I guess this little robot would also use that data to like respond, right? So like, 
it, it doesn't make sense. Like the robot also, like you wouldn't even have to put it on the couch. This robot will just come up and sit next to the couch when you go to that, sit on the couch. <laughs> like it just follows you around like this weird little shadow. But it it the patent was specific in saying that it is of its own accord, meaning that it has some sort of free will where it could choose to not sit on the couch with you. Like, so then what's this robot doing? Like if the whole point is to play games with you, but then it's like, doesn't feel like sitting on the couch because it gets to pick. Like, what is the point? I don't get it. Uh, there, Like you said, there, there, there's so many places to start with this. This is uh, when I was reading through the patent information, when they say it was created to usher in a joint viewing experience <laughs> in order to motivate users to play games and react to them <laughs> in the absence of face-to-face -face relationships with another person. Okay, so one, one, peel back, peel back here, guys. One second. Motivate users to play games and react to them. In Okay, so when you're home alone, you react to games, right, JD? I'm sure if something... If something scares like, me, it would, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. If I love something, yeah. <laughs> so, so now there's this robot watching me. Is that supposed to motivate me to react? Or like, if <laughs> is this robot going to be like when I no scope someone? Are they going to be like, good kill, bro? And then like try to robo <laughs> GG, <-G>, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but they're just like, it's just so funny. It's like motivate players to, you know, react to, the, to games. We're already reacting to games. We get mad. You right. see people flipping their keyboards. But in the absence of face-to-face -face relationships with another person, <laughs> that is so scary to me. Like, I, this is this is one of the craziest things that's that's happened to gaming in a while. Okay, so there are two other bits of this story that are absolutely mind blowing, right? So mm -hmm. the robot. So so first, still in the physical world, the robot has a love index, which <laughs> will measure. <laughs> basically how the player talks to the robot in moments of tension right so like <laughs> so like <laughs> i don't even know how to say this right so like uh if the player like so like let's say the robot needs to be charged right is the example they use if the player doesn't go to charge the robot quickly it will rate that as the player not loving the robot and then it will react as if it were being like abused versus loved right like or like if you tell the robot it's being too noisy it will like feel bad and like sulk it, it's the weirdest thing right like and then like the robot will tell you to go to bed <laughs> like it will it's if it loves you and perceives it as love it will try to like encourage you to like do things that are good for you so it'll be like okay like it's 9 30 like go to bed okay so all of that all in itself is extremely weird to take it one step further, right? Because we're seeing a lot of AR and VR development. Not only have they created and patented this physical robot, but they've also patented a computer generation version of this robot, which would be in VR with you. So like if you're in a VR game, like you could turn to your side and like this little robot's hanging out with you. Like what? What is happening? The future is scary, my friend. I... This is this is this is what leads to Skynet. It's Sony. They've done it. <laughs> they, Dude, <they're... laughs> this whole story like could have been its own pod on its own because it is so yeah. weird. Like, yeah, it is so weird. Like, and like if you love the robot, the robot plays games better. Like, so like one of the quotes in the patent is. It is expected that the user's affinity with the robot is increased and motivation for playing a game is enhanced by the robot viewing the gameplay next to the user and being pleased or sad together. What? I, I mean, I, maybe I'll just make the robot watch the beginning of uh, Last of Us Part 1 uh, just over and over and over again. <laughs> just to make it real sad. I, <laughs> Dude, I just what like there's like almost no words. This is like the Tiger King of like game of stories. gaming like, right now. Yeah, yeah. Every time there's like a thing that you're like, oh, this is the craziest thing in this. It's just like there's a crazier thing still. Like, to... I don't even know. Like this, obviously, if it comes to fruition, will blow my mind. And it feels like this is a patent that's just like out there as a blanket patent, right? Like just in mm. case it's there. And like, there's no way this will ever, ever, ever come to market. But then, like, at the same time, I think about, like, how much weird crap we've seen. And, like, this might come to market, terrifyingly so. This very well could be a thing that comes out. Like, I, I don't know, dude. I don't get it.
I mean, it could be 20 years down the road, but like the environment's harsher outside. People are always using DoorDash and like, you know, uh, task rabbits to do things and no one leaves their homes. So yeah, why not have a fluffy, <laughs> terrifying, emotionally, you know, <laughs> unavailable yeah. robot in your home? Yeah, 20 years from now and the ESA is like, all right, guys, E3 2020 is just going to be delayed another couple of months. Don't worry, it's still going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that brings us to the end of the scanning report, my friend. <sighs> and it is time for the staple of the show, uh, the Game Pitch Podcast, where you, uh, you're going to pitch us a game this week. I am, yeah. So first off, thanks everyone for hanging in. It's kind of a longer pod than normal, but uh, hopefully you found it entertaining, enlightening, and you found it just downright, downright filling you with joy. So I have, like I said, I've been working from home this week. Where I'm on this uh, rotation where I work two weeks in, two weeks out. So I'm on my out rotation from the office. And so one thing that my wife and I have been really, 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 really into is we've been absolutely binging the Great British Baking Show, which is phenomenal. Like, I, I don't know why I didn't watch this sooner because I really do like cooking shows a lot. And so I had seen this over and over and over and never gotten into it. And we just decided on a whim, like, we should start and loved it right and we're just like crushing through this show right now and so the core inspiration of this is like in that show the judges are so nice still right and so like even if something is like kind of burnt they're still like oh yeah but the flavor like it's really good if only you had gotten the bake right or they're like oh i really love this idea i wish you would have done it like this like they're so positive they're so constructive which is just such a contrast to like anything that's judged here in the mm. state where it's just like oh this is garbage and there's like no constructive piece to it right it's just miserable and so what i was thinking about this week is like taking that element of being judged right and like what happens to the contestants after the show. And so my core pitch, right, is it's kind of like a choose your own adventure game where you are the judge of a competition and mm. in it, you get these set responses. And so, so when something happens, right, like it could be good, it could be bad performance wise or whatever. Um, and you get to pick what your response is. And that response then will play out this adventure component for the contestant, but it's like you only get a certain amount of choices up front and then you get to, then you watch how that plays out in that person's life mm. and like what it does to that person, right? What your and advice so does, right? Yeah, exactly, right? Awesome. And so, and, and it's not like a long thing, right? Like, so one of the things I was thinking is like just to take that baking thing and run, like you're, you're doing like a baking competition, for example. And it, it could be like different seasons of the game have different things that you judge, right? And you're a different mm -hmm, type of judge, mm -hmm. whatever. But so up front, let's just say it's baking. And so like you rip someone apart for a cupcake, right? So like in this game, you can be really harsh. And then like it could lead to a really tragic like path for that person that you get to play through and you get to see it right and so then yeah. that would shape as a player like how are you going to judge the next person the next person the next person right so it's just like it's very much like a narratively not like crazy platforming or anything it's very storyline driven yeah no yeah like um that. yeah so it just has these hardcore ripple effects and so just keeping with the the baking theme i figured we would title this game burnt Burnt. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. Planet Entertainment, that's your next game idea. Totally <laughs> authorized. Burnt, colon, very much not the British Baking Show judging game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the absolute opposite. No, and I like, like, yeah, because you, we, so you're essentially following the through line of a judge, a contest judge. So, like, right. Like you were saying, like, it could almost be an America's Got Talent kind of thing, and the sure, different sure. seasons could be different types of reality shows. So, it could yeah, be, exactly. You know, the, the baking, you know, the is the first one, and then, then it's a singing one, then it's a dancing one. Yeah, I get it. I, yeah. I love it. I love the idea seeing the effects of your dialogue trees on a person. Yeah. And maybe, yeah, that's so interesting because maybe you're like in charge of a production company, and if they like you enough and you give them good enough advice, they like join your production company, and then you get like money and royalties off of their success success because you help them get better yeah or, i mean there's yeah. a lot of potential to it yeah <laughs> it's like oh no you gave bad advice and then they're in rehab and you're just like oh right exactly like it could just be like really dark endings for some of these people right like 
So it's yeah, and and then like the idea is too. There's so much replayability because like then you could go back and play that season, and like maybe you were super mean to someone, and you were super nice this go around, and vice versa, and then like you get to see that person's story go the total opposite way, right? Yeah, burnt. Good stuff. Thanks, buddy. Coming to Planet Entertainment very soon. Being sold <laughs> in front of a GameStop, in, out of a trunk, out of a trunk by <laughs> Kajit for coin. <laughs> Yeah, man. Um, so uh, wrapping up the show here, we have a few final things. Uh, I have a red card to give out, JD. And okay. you made me realize this, that people copy games a lot, but some yeah. people are kind of inspired by and other people just completely, completely rip it off. So Riot right. Games, they recently acquired a studio called Hypixel Studios. And I was like, oh, Riot Games is acquiring a studio. This is big because Riot you know, Games, they, they're one of the they do League of Legends and now Valorant or Valiant. I keep mixing up which one it's called. <laughs> but so they acquired a studio and that, I was taking note of that because they don't typically do that. And this studio, Hypixel, they're making a game called Hytale and it looks just like Minecraft. And not like, like this looks like a clone of Minecraft almost to the, 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 the way that I'm just like, how are they not getting sued? How is it possible that they can make this game even? Because oh. it's like Minecraft, which is more animations. It's just Minecraft with like, it's just like, oh, the animals are like, it's, I guess it's like if you were to upgrade from the SNES or from the NES to the um, SNES, like it's like, it looks like 16 bit um, versus okay. 8 bit uh, Minecraft because it. it's still, it's still Minecraft in the same way, but like all, just all the characters have more fluid animations and like facial, facial expressions, but it ah. is Minecraft. Like it just is. So I don't, I don't know even how they can make this game, but I wanted to hand out a red card for just copying, make something original, make something your own. And, and maybe I'm wrong. And there's hundreds of people at the studio who work really hard, but it, I don't know. It, it rubbed me the wrong way. And when you talked about Trigger Witch last week or not Trigger Witch, I'm sorry. I'm um, the Witchbrook game. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you talked about that, uh, that made me realize, man, when people rip off someone else's game, that sucks. Yeah. And that's like, especially true. Well, I mean, and, and it's kind of a tale of two games, right? Cause when you, think about Witchbrook and stardew it's very much like an indie dev getting ripped off and then you have on this the other side minecraft which is like one of the most valuable ips worth billions maybe it doesn't hurt them quite as much <laughs> but that yeah. doesn't you know still it, it takes away that creative level of like i'm never a fan of seeing somebody else just absolutely rip off a bit and so it, it just sucks it's crappy i agree that's a good red card this week thank you yeah, and sticking in the Minecraft theme, um, I was I was wrong once again. Here I am being wrong. Uh, I'm going to give myself a penalty. Originally, I made fun of the Xbox uh, showing off ray traced or talking about how good ray traced Minecraft did. would look. Yeah, yeah, it was just like this is stupid. It's Minecraft. It looks like yeah. Minecraft. But uh, then I watched a video of the before and after with the ray tracing and the non ray tracing, and holy crap, it looks great. <laughs> it looks so <laughs> sick. I was like, oh my god, I was wrong. This is so cool. Yeah, I remember making fun of this where I was like, how would you even know, like, you could just go outside and take a photo and be like, I made this in Minecraft, and people would be like, oh, okay, cool. Like, I remember uh, explicitly making fun of this, so this is a penalty for both of us. Yeah, it's like, it's like I guess just, I didn't, I don't really know what ray tracing is, maybe I need to do some research on it more, because, uh, you know, we do a game podcast, but <laughs> the lighting was just incredible, man. It looks so freaking good. I was like, well, yep, cool. I'm glad devs will be able to use this you know hopefully they're much smarter than me and can take advantage of it they are much <laughs> smarter than me oh me too don't worry yeah me as well uh <laughs> well cool i think that wraps it up guys thanks again i know this was a long show um it's uh you know just kind of us getting into our groove and getting better and better and more and more stuff to talk about um and so you know when you listen to this show hopefully you can have your sony couch buddy next to you and you can react really positively so your little couch robot will you know tell you to keep downloading future episodes of our show <laughs> i agree i mean <laughs> uh, uh, there are a ton of ways that you can get in touch with us we're on twitter and on instagram at game pitch pod i am at j to the d and eli is at mario rpgino on youtube you can search game pitch podcast and you can find our youtube channel with all our behind the scenes content you can email us at game pitch podcast at gmail.com uh, and yeah, we, uh, we'd we love to hear from you on anything about this episode or any of the uh, episodes of the past. Eli, anything else? No, I love you guys out there. Keep playing games. Don't hurt me too much. Don't at me too hard about the Final <laughs> Fantasy VII stuff. I know. I know it's I know it's it's great. I get it. I understand. But still. You can at me as hard as you want. <laughs>